In part B of the module on wave energy, we will look at the different types of wave energy conversion devices. Let's start with the basic functionality. These devices convert wave energy, which we know have, has both kinetic and potential energy, into useful mechanical energy. The mechanical energy is then converted in turn to electrical energy. There are some examples where the mechanical energy is used for a reverse osmosis process for, for desalinating water. There are lots of really creative wave energy conversion devices out there. It is a lot easier to organize them if there are classification categories, and indeed there are two good ways to classify wave energy conversion devices. So let's start off first <clears throat> wave energy classification by location. So in the part A of <clears throat> in part A of the course we learned that uh, waves can be classified into deep water waves, intermediate or transitional water waves and shallow water waves. Uh, so it would make sense to have a parallel wave energy converter classification uh, by depth. So floating offshore in deep water, tethered to the seabed in intermediate depths or fixed to the seabed in shallow water. Uh, depth, as you might imagine, has an effect on power. Uh, so this is some data for the western UK. Uh, Thorpe estimated how the average wave power varies with depth, and you can see that it varies quite substantially. Uh, clearly more power is available in deeper water, uh, but that does present challenges, uh, one of which is getting power to the shore. Underwater power cables uh, are very expensive. and uh, Further from shore, uh, the more powerful the waves, but also that means in a storm they're more powerful, and so survivability is an issue. We can also classify wave energy converters by geometry or orientation. Uh, so the three categories are terminators, attenuators, or point absorbers. Uh, so for terminators, the principal axis is parallel to the wave front, and these devices physically intercept the waves. Attenuators have their principal axis perpendicular to the wavefront, and wave energy is extracted as the wave moves past it. Point absorbers, essentially tethered buoy systems, ride the surface of the wave and again extract wave energy as the wave passes underneath it. Uh, point absorbers tend to have small dimensions relative to the incident wavelength. We will have a separate lecture on each of the three wave energy converter uh, types, uh, terminators, attenuators, and point absorbers. However, in the remainder of this lecture, I would like to cover a special case of wave energy conversion device, those that are built, built into the shoreline. Right? So the categories we just looked at all deal with things that are located offshore in water. Uh, so these shoreline wave energy converters are terminators by location. Uh, waves stop at the shoreline. There are two historical examples. Tapchen, which was built into an island about 30 kilometers from Oslo, Norway, uh, and operated uh, during the period from 1985 to 1991. And Limpet, which was, is, was built into the Isle of Islay on the west coast of Scotland, uh, and it was developed by WaveGen uh, jointly with Queen's University Belfast. And that one started operation in 2000 and is still running. Uh, so we want to talk about each of these in some detail. So let's start with TAPCHEN. TAPCHEN stands for Tapered Channel Water Power Plant. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there's a big water reservoir there with a tapered channel feeding into it. Uh, so you start off by forcing water through the tapered channel, as the blue arrow shows. Uh, so the wave's kinetic energy is converted into potential energy and is captured in the water reservoir. So if you look at the uh, different uh, height, you can see that as the water comes up the channel, it rises in height and indeed it overtops, uh, in practice, overtops these side channels and flows on into the, into the water reservoir then. Uh, so the next step that happens then is uh, we recover power by the water uh, from the water reservoir flowing out through the a low head turbine in the powerhouse and uh, 
we have a range of uh, water head uh, to operate the turbines. Uh, so a characteristic of this large water reservoir is that it stores water between the waves and so the fluctuations in head that the turbine sees are minimized uh, compared to uh, something which might be offshore. Uh, so let's look at the funnel and reservoir. Uh, so the funnel is uh, about 40 meters wide at the opening, uh, so a bit wider perhaps than appears from this image, uh, 6 to 7 meters deep, and it rises to a total height 2 to 3 meters above the mean sea level. I mentioned before the idea that waves over top, so as they flow up here, they slop over the, over the channel edges uh, into the reservoir. Uh, so the reservoir area is about 8,500 square meters, so fairly large surface area. The power system consists of a 350 kilowatt turbine generator. Uh, it's very conventional hydroelectric uh, technology, a low head turbine. And uh, the volume flow rate is such that the water level falls about a half a meter in five minutes without continual overtopping. Uh, so again, the benefit of the sort of large water reservoir is to f smooth out the fluctuations that otherwise occur. Uh, so let's do a little bit of history. This system commenced operation in 1985. It survived a number of severe extreme storms. Uh, and unfortunately, in 1991, uh, the tapered channel was accidentally damaged while attempting to improve its shape. And unfortunately, it never operated again due to a lack of funds for repair. Uh, so that's uh, the extent of um, experience gained with uh, TapChan. So let's turn our attention to LIMPET. Uh, LIMPET stands for Land Installed Marine Power Energy Transmitter. Uh, these photos show the Isle of Islay installation, which we will come back to uh, in two slides after we've talked a little bit about the technology. Uh, so the technology is what's called oscillating water column technology. Uh, so the limpet acts by having a wave surface alternatively first compress and then draw air through a turbine. So wave energy is converted to pneumatic energy. So in the image on the left here, the cross section, so these uh, two parts right here, this part here and here, uh, show a concrete, concrete structure built into the shoreline. So here's the bottom of the sea, and back here is, uh, is the shore. Uh, and so as a wave enters, water level rises in the chamber here, and uh, air is compressed in this air chamber, and then forced through this uh, unit here, which is a wells turbine that drives a generator. I'll say more about the wells turbine in a minute. So looking at the structure for the reverse process, uh, so as the wave flows out, so the arrow showing the flow outward here now, the level of water here drops, and so the pressure in the air chamber also decreases, and that results in drawing air in through the well's turbine. All right, so a key point to notice here is that, uh, so the water is uh, essentially acting as a, a compressor, decompressor of the air in the chamber, but notice that the flow through the turbine uh, changes direction. So now let's turn to the question of what is a Wells turbine. So Wells turbine was specifically developed for oscillating water column wave energy converters. Uh, its unique characteristic is that the rotation is in the same direction for both forward and reverse air flows. Uh, so in this particular f image, uh, the blue arrows show uh, air entering from the bottom, flowing out the top, uh, but as you saw in the previous slide, uh, flow reverses, and so uh, at some point in the cycle, air would be coming in the top of this image and flowing out through the bottom. So this is made possible by using a symmetrical airfoil. Uh, so you can see that right here. Look at the symmetrical shape. Uh, we, we know something about airfoil shapes now from the wind part of the course. Uh, the result of having a symmetrical airfoil is a reduced efficiency as it's not, it's, it has a non-optimal angle of attack. However, there are some compensating factors and that is simplicity and low cost. All right, so let's come back to the photos again. So now you can see 
Uh, the image on the left shows the outward face. This is the face that the wave actually breaks over. You can see uh, the water's edge right here moving along the front edge. And so the red arrow shows the direction of water coming into this device. And indeed the entrance uh, is below the water line here, as you could see in the previous slide. Uh, the slide on the image on the right of the slide shows the side view of the system. Uh, you can see the uh, face uh, here, which is going down uh, lower towards the water surface. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of the limpet system installed in this in, in this particular location. Uh, it actually was based on some previous experience with a prototype. So the prototype was only 75 kilowatts, constructed in 1991 and decommissioned in 1999. It was built nearby. It wasn't in exactly the same location, but uh, the design of limpet was based on the prototype. Uh, it had a the Limpet itself has a 21 meter collector width for 500 kilowatts uh, designed operating power. Uh, the design anticipated 40% capacity factor for a 200 kilowatt average power output. Uh, the power system consisted of two counter rotating wells turbines, each driving a 250 kilowatt generator, uh, which would give a 500 kilowatt maximum total power output. Uh, so the unit commenced operation in November of 2000. Uh, the performance was uh, somewhat disappointing and uh, very careful analysis was done. Uh, and uh, as a result of the, they identified what the problems were, but the rating was subsequently reduced to 250 kilowatts. Uh, so the system uh, celebrated its 10th anniversary of operation in November 2010. And uh, the announcement of that anniversary indicated that in the months prior to the anniversary it had achieved 98% availability, which is excellent. Uh, the project uh, report produced by Queen's University Belfast in 2002 is a very interesting document. It talks about all the construction and uh, the analysis of the problems they encountered. Uh, the references listed on the final slide of the slide deck and so uh, if you're interested uh, certainly feel free to track that down. It's still available on the internet. Uh, so the status of Limpet, uh, the company that developed it, uh, WaveGen together with uh, Queen's University Belfast was purchased by uh, Vought uh, in 2005 uh, but the company closed the WaveGen operation in Inverness, Scotland in 2013. Uh, the Vought um, website still has a pay, page on wave energy and that contains a very nice animation of the limpet oscillating water column technology if you want to take a look at it. Uh, so the current status is unknown to me. Uh, it would appear from a BBC video posted in January 2014 that it is still in operation. Uh, possibly the local electric utility is still operating it. Uh, if anyone has any local information, don't hesitate to post on the forum for this lecture. Uh, so there were other planned limpet projects, uh, but those did not proceed. And I think the reason had to do with the uh, lack of ability to connect. Uh, so there was a proposed Western Isles subsea power cable to link renewable projects to mainland Scotland. And the cost of that proved too, too high. And so I that resulted in the, essentially the cancellation of all the limpet projects. And that's probably what led to the uh, closure of, of WaveGen. Uh, so um, there was a related project called Osprey, Ocean Swell Powered Renewable Energy. And that was an offshore oscillating water column structure developed by WaveGen. So it basically sat on the bottom in relatively shallow water. Uh, the prototype was destroyed in a storm in 1995 and to the best of my knowledge uh, there was no further development of that. So where is oscillating water column today? Uh, there is an Australian company Ocean Links uh, which has developed an updated version of oscillating water column technology. Uh, their green wave uh, device is a prefabricated concrete uh, structure. Uh, it can uh, be incorporated 
into a seawall or breakwater or stand on its own in shallow water, 10 to 15 meters of water. Uh, it has power outputs of up to one megawatt or more. Uh, now, there was a major project announced in 2012, one megawatts in, uh, to be located at Port MacDonald in South Australia. Uh, but there have been no further updates uh, since that initial announcement. So anyone with local information, feel free to post to the lecture forum. So let's summarize uh, what we've learned so far about wave energy conversion devices. Uh, first of all, classification. We learned uh, two ways of classifying these devices. Uh, so first of all, by location, essentially by water depth, so floating offshore in deep water, tethered to the seabed in intermediate depths, and fixed to the seabed in shallow water. Uh, so second, classification by geometry or, and ori or orientation. And we have the three categories, terminators, attenuators, and point absorbers. Uh, so they differ. The terminators have the principal axis parallel to the wave front. They physically intercept the waves. The attenuators have their principal axis perpendicular to the wave front, and they extract wave energy as the wave moves past it and point absorbers are essentially tethered buoy systems and uh, they um, again extract energy as the wave moves under the device basically okay so uh, we also talked about uh, a special case which is shoreline wave energy conversion devices they're all terminators by nature since the wave stops at the shoreline uh, we talked about two examples in detail, historical examples, Tapchen and Limpet, and uh, pointed out that there is a current development in this area. Uh, so what's next? Uh, we will have a separate lecture on each of the three types, terminators, attenuators, and point absorbers. Uh, so please proceed to those uh, individual lectures.